Hey guys, it's Drew with the Kusha Collectibles. Welcome back to a brand new video. We're sitting down with Treasure Town today and we're sitting down with Nicely Numismatics talking a little bit about the market, a little bit about things that kind of concern me and some interesting stories as well. So let's get this video started. For all that don't know, uh, Christian from Treasure Town is someone that is really involved in creating a lot of content for the numismatic space. He just hit over 100,000 subscribers, so make sure to go subscribe to him if you haven't yet. But like I said, we're going to be talking a little bit about some of my experiences over the past 12 months, some things that you guys haven't heard of before, and so you know, and Christian's a really good interviewer and he also has Isaiah Nicely on there as well. Uh, Nicely Numismatics, um, just a really good kid, someone that really loves the hobby and it always has a smile on his face. So go check out their channel, make sure to subscribe. But let's get this video started and show you guys a little bit of uh, what's going on with them. So uh, an advice I would have for somebody that's in this space is that the only way that you're going to really be able to stick out and be be unequivocally you is that you Hello everybody, Christian from Treasure Town here, and I'm joined by Isaiah, who's part of Treasure Town, but Drew Haddock, our main guest owner of Akusha Collectibles. He has his own YouTube channel that's quite popular, and he's a coin dealer down south, much more sort of on the ground, hitting more coin shows than I would go to on a regular basis, um, but has his uh, strong own social media following. But we're going to be talking about a lot of what's going on, some tips that he has, a lot of the experience he's living. So, um, Great to have you, Drew. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Isaiah, for having me on. I appreciate it. So I think today maybe we just sort of start out with a little bit of a basic question. What's been going on in the market? You know, things were really hot through COVID. We're about two months out at this point um, from that initial people getting sent home in March and, and staying in. Um, sort of what's been the difference maybe in the past three, four months compared to, you know, the super hot market um, before then? If we like, took it back, you know, three or four years a lot of stuff has dramatically increased and we can even uh, associate that with, you know, gas prices and everything else. Um, but I do see that like people getting back to work, people getting more busy and less uh, screen time. Uh, it really can cut down on uh, who's interested in coins and then also can cut down, uh, you know, then in retrospect on those dealers that want to buy for their clients. So getting people back to work um, and getting people, you know, back on the marketplace, it just gets them busy and they end up saving more money than spending it. And, you know, that was a, that's, that's kind of my take on the, on the market right now. People are just getting back to work and uh, I hope it, hope it's, you know, hope it does well. But yeah, that's my answer for that. And do you think that we're actually seeing a slowdown? You know, is it, is it like, so we have a run up in price, are things leveling out? Um, are they taking an active dip or just increasing at a slower rate? What's your sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, the question that I toss back between myself and my and my brother um, is, are we at you know a bubble or are we at the new low? Are we at the new you know, floor for numismatics? And really, there's really no way for me to tell you honestly because uh, it's just like predicting the stock market and other things. You have to kind of have a crystal ball. Um, but like most kind of coin dealers would tell you, find the coins that you like and find the coins that you want in your collection for 50 years, and you'll be fine with that. Yeah. And then as sort of a dealer going through and like what's giving you the signals that this is actually happening? You know, are you going to shows and people are just not paying and buying tons of materials sort of with the same vigor that they were before, where you've got people who immediately have a buyer and, and you know, things sell out quickly? You know, are you having to just price the coins lower or, you know, put more effort into who you, you're selling them to? Like what's sort of informing that? So a lot of the formation of of everything that's been going on with me is that like we go to shows and there doesn't seem to be many much material um co coming to shows so like we would find old holders we would find really nice rare coins stuff you know diamond in the rough kind of things and then a as of lately i think that once there's a that lower in demand but also when people aren't home they aren't listing their coins on ebay they aren't going to shows to trade them um so everyone was out buying and everyone was, the prices were going up. And I think a lot of collectors just say, I'm going to stay home and then I'm going to go to work. And then I'm not going to really be going into the marketplace to exchange these coins. So I think a lot of the show, the shows that I've seen late recently have just been just very hard to find good coins. 
Um, but I don't see a lot of wavering in terms of pricing in the market. Um, but it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell because asking a lot of dealers, they don't give you too much information. It's all really about how I felt the temperature either rising or cooling since the beginning of of us dealing in coins. And maybe we step back a little bit just to understand, like you as you know, a young coin dealer. What is your sort of twenty twenty two coin dealing business model? Um, you know, we have viewers of all ages who've been in the hobby for a long time or a short time. Like, what are the primary factors, and, and how are you? you know, making a profit, supporting yourself, putting food on the table with the business. Right. So what we kind of do and what uh, our different approach when it comes to coin shows now is that, uh, you know, there's there's people that are kind of uh, willing to spend a lot of money on coins. and There's people that are going to be a little bit more reserved on spending money on coins. And the way that we've really been chasing our profit margin is been we've been going after coins that give us 20 percent or more in profit margin. And the way, the reason why that's good is because, you know, uh, you get that a little bit more profit on that coin, but also you're not spending um, as much. You're being a little bit more selective. So if there is a turn in the market, then you do have that opportunity to have that room. So say if you have 20% margin on a coin and you can make that in the next three months, but say in the next six months, the market falls out and you lose, you know, the, everything goes down 25%, you're still in a good spot. So uh, for a lot of the new and upcoming, you know, up and coming coin dealers, I would say be very careful of what you pick and also be careful of what you want to spend your money on. Because you may walk into a 200 dealer show with $10,000, but and you can make everything in the room you can make 10% on. But at the end of the day, you're going to be wanting to find things that make you the best money and also give you a way out. So that sounds great in terms of targeting a few of the higher percentage, um, you know, coins. And I'm sure that there's some that are, you know, well above a 20 percent. Um, do you have any specific examples? If you can remember the grades, that would be great. And sort of the prices paid. Maybe you cracked it out, sent it in, it upgraded. Maybe you sent it to CAC, but just some of the types of materials that you've had some hits or, you know, doubles, triples, home runs on recently. So uh, this might be a part of the next question, but we're going to include this in this question. Um, like. We've been focusing on three cent silvers and ones that are a little bit low, uh, lower mintage. So we bought an 1866 three cent silver and it was a it was a proof and it was improved 65 from NGC. It had some kind of terminal toning, but really liquid fields, a few kind of spots holding it back from Cameo. But we bought that at the show in Mississippi for 1350 and then we sold it for 1900 when we got home. So uh, that covered all the costs of the whole show. And everything else that we bought was just, you know, it was just cake on top. So um, well, there's a great thing that you guys should, uh, you know, follow. And we've we've talked to a few dealers and they said that basically when they go to a show, they're looking for that winner. They're looking for that coin that covers all their costs. And then the rest of the coins that they're looking for can just be, like I said, cake on top. So that's kind of one of our uh, one of our wins, but also something recently that we've been selling pretty good with um, just because. A lot of those, you know, a little bit more of expensive coins go to market at Heritage and then they sell for, you know, 50 percent over what price guy would say it is. So, um, you know, just keeping an eye out on what's available and, uh, you know, a little bit a little bit of a tougher coin is always the best thing to sell. Hey, guys, are you enjoying the interview so far? If you are, please leave a like. Comment your thoughts about what has been said so far. Make sure to keep listening till the end because there's going to be some interesting topics that we continue to talk about and uh, develop. And uh, yeah, let's get back to today's interview. Okay, and and I have a little, you know, in terms of those tougher coins, you know, maybe there's a little more risk if there is a pullback. But sounds like you priced it right and knew you had a buyer. Are you seeing a lot of the successes be, you know, you sell that coin when you get home to a dealer, or is that because you have a big client list? Then I think after this, Isaiah has a question. So I would say, uh, basically, we sold it that coin to a dealer, and uh, we have a we have certain client lists for certain coins. So say you know there's commemoratives, there's half dollars, all that type of stuff. Um, right now we really have a lot of uh, collectors that like commemoratives. So about eighty to ninety percent of the commemoratives we get in, we never post on the website. We just sell them, and then there's a lot of stuff like Indian head cents or a little bit of a rare coin. Uh, we would sell to uh, a dealer. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to move that more to a collector base. But I would say most of it right now uh, would be about dealer to dealer stuff. Yeah, Andrew, you're talking a lot about um, these winners and 
uh, coins that have a pretty good margin on them. Uh, so can you recount any examples when like you kind of bit the risk and uh, maybe like fell flat on your face or, you know, just had a, had a mishap happen? Yeah, that's a great question, Isaiah. Uh, we went to the pan show about, I think, six or eight months ago, something in between there. And we ended up buying a 20 cent piece from 1876. It's a little bit of a lower mintage. And uh, seeing the coin in hand when we bought it, it had some hairlines on it. And so we wanted to give it a go again and see if it would upgrade. And we've sent it in about three times now after cracking it out. And it's come back on details every time. And it was a, it was a mid-state coin. So, I mean, I think we're like, we probably lost about $800 on that coin. So that was one of my bigger losers for sure this year. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good question. A lot of people ask about the wins, but I think it's uh, good to have the losses in there too. What have you like really learned out of that? Uh, just that one experience with the hairlines. So what I would recommend is don't buy coins with hairlines because if you do, uh, they might let you uh, through once, but they're not going to let you through again. That's just my opinion. Um, sometimes they're, you know, they say it's okay. You know, there's uh, certain circumstances where they let stuff through, or I could find a coin at a show and, and to see, I would look to see if it would cack and the coin would have hairlines on it. And I know it wouldn't cack, but if I crack that coin out today and send it back in, it would go on details. So, uh, what I would say is do as much research as you can beforehand, you know, and once, you know, we create more videos and more content, a lot of that will be apparent for sure. And I think cool. sort of going off of that and, and it'll lead into another question, like we have these losses, you know, what are some of the things you're thinking? How do you like think about cost going to a show um, and like when it's worth it to go to a show, travel X amount, you know, there there's hotels, there's, you know, gas, there's lots of different costs. So, um, you know, what's sort of your mentality in terms of how you make shows viable, given that that's a big thing you do? So we try to get um, so we try to get most of our shows within eight hours of driving. And the reason being is because everything goes up exponentially as you drive. Um, and what, what I'm saying is basically anything past eight hours, you have to basically get a hotel room. You have to get food uh, multiple days. You're also uh, having to stay some more when you're there. And so if you're going anywhere like above eight hours, you're ending up spending a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars. And so a lot of that really is just out of our wheelhouse right now. Um, so the Mississippi one was pretty good. And it's a great example because we only drove six hours each way. It was an easy one day trip. And then we got everything done. And that's kind of where we anchor ourselves from uh, driving and the cost perspective. And we actually just bought a, a car that would uh, drive us and it would go about 45 miles per gallon. So that would save us on fuel costs. So basically the way I would ask people or check on people to approach coin shows is that, you know, is it okay for you to spend that much money and will you be able to make it back um, when you're buying coins at the show? And thankfully the right coins were at that show and we didn't have too much cost going into it and it ended up doing very well. And the best way you can, you know, do better at this over time is that you just get better at looking for great coins and then knowing where to sell them at. And then you'll be able to go to those bigger shows and spend that $2,000, $3,000 to get there. Yeah. And, and with the, the shows, you know, there's larger shows, there's more small local shows, you know, there's like the national ones where a bunch of people are flying in. What do you think the big differences are between, you know, a, a local or regional coin show and then something much larger? Well, uh, the big difference that I'm seeing right now is that the local shows, the inventory is a little bit more dried up. And I've and I've seen at the bigger shows that they're willing to spend tons and tons of money on great coins. And that's why a lot of people go to those big shows. But when you're when you go to a booth at a big show and they bought half their coins from Heritage and they pay the top of, you know, the top of the roof in terms of premium. That that's a little bit challenging for a, a bigger show perspective, but for a smaller show, you know, if you go there, you drive three hours and then you get there and there's not much, they're selling Morgan dollars that are mint state 62. Uh, so, th you know, it basically is, you have to be very selective on where you want to go and how you want to spend your time. And uh, they both have their pros and cons for sure. 
And uh, do, do you think that a lot of your big wins come from the smaller shows, you know, after having developed a better eye where you can do something like that, you know, 1350 to 1900 flip on a three cent silver? Um, or, or are they when you're really sourcing premium material from some of the larger shows, even if you pay up for it? Well, I, I realized that a lot of the smaller shows um, is, a, you know, for, for us is a better thing because say that, you know, they, the dealers that you really like are halfway across the country. And the only time you see them is when you spend $2,000 to get there. Right. And what we've been trying to focus on locally is that, do you know the dealer? Do you talk to the dealer? Do you have their phone number? Will you be the first person at the door at the coin show? And if you are, great coins end up being there. Um, but it ends up being just for the select few, right? Um, so say that we we actually got went to a coin show recently that was three hours away. Um, it was the Collin County coin show. We got there the night before, and we sat out in the lobby for an hour and a half before the show opened. And that's just so we can make sure we get the coins that everybody else wanted. So what I would say is just, uh, you know, focus on the local connections that you have first, because at the end of the day, if you grow those connections and you create relationships, those will end up making you the most money as opposed to flying out to all these bigger shows. It's just just for starting out, though. I know there's some big wigs that that know what they're doing and they have a lot of great people they talk to. But just from the funnel, fundamental uh, perspective, starting out small, going to small shows, uh, really will help you in the long run. And do you have strong relationships that you've made with individual dealers? And like there's, you know, 80 dealers set up, you know, you're going to talk to 10, not really do much with the other 70. Um, and then you visit them every time that show's going on to look for new material. Or are you just sort of you walk up to anybody and, and start picking through what they've got? So basically, we, you know, we do the old uh, tap on the shoulder or we say, hey, how's your week going? But everybody knows why you're there, right? Um, for some dealers, we we uh, buy them lunch or we, um, you know, just sit down, talk with them while they're setting up their cases. So a lot of it has to do with where was the last, uh, you know, where was the last big win for you? Uh, you're going to see the same dealers that move the same stuff in as the old show. They don't really have too many people that they sell to. Um, it's more of just a hobby or something that they enjoy during their retirement. But there's a lot of those guys in that room also that are very hungry and they want to sell you coins and they always have some decent stuff. So those people will ring in your ears more likely than the people that, you know, just like to move coins back and forth. So what I would say is just know the big wigs in the room and focus on uh, buying from them and cultivating a relationship. I think in a different direction, one thing I've been thinking about is, you know, how much of the coin market is dealers and how much of it is collectors? Like if you took all the dealers holding inventory, like auctioned off everything that they had with the stipulation that, you know, none of it was for resale in the next six months, you know, not it's not realistic. But like how much, you know, if, if the number of dealers holding inventory cut down by half, you know, how much can the coin market absorb and how much is sort of organic original demand versus um, you know, demand from dealers who are just buying it to flip it? Yeah, that's a great question. And once again, it, it would, would require, uh, you know, a crystal ball. And but the, what you should also add into the mix is auction houses. Auction houses will buy coins from people before they even send them to auction. So, you know, thinking about the billions of dollars that's within collectors pockets and in, in their hand and also for dealers, but there also is the auction houses. They will fly out six people to go to a show and they will dismantle that show and they will buy everything that they can. So auction houses do have a big stake in this, too, um, just because what they do, just like how Heritage does it, they're very selective on what they put out every single week. And they're also very selective on like they'll do old holder sales or they'll uh, or they'll do like key date Morgan sales. And so all of it's very uh, precisely chosen. And so those people also have a lot of stuff that they're holding back and that they're very, you know, they think they're going to go up in, in value. And so, uh, yeah, but it's very tough to, to know that for sure. I hope to know that one day. That'd be great. Yeah. And in, in terms of like then thinking about that collector demand, you said a lot of it's sort of, you know, maybe the commemorative side, but you've also been doing a fair amount with three cent silvers. Like, do you have any comment on just doing a thought experiment, thinking really what's at the root of these driving forces right yeah i think the what the root at the root of all these driving forces would be 
um, you know, is it the coin that they want at the end of the day? It's like going to like a fast food restaurant, right? You ask for cheese and pickles and whatever else, and then they hand it to you, and they you don't even have a chicken sandwich in there, right? There's not there's nothing on going on to the sandwich, nothing that you ask for. And so at the end of the day, people are looking for great coins, better dates, and all of that really is driving the market, in my opinion. Like, I would get ten coins at a show, and I would sell two of them just because I know that someone would love them, and they've been waiting for them. And so back to the kind of what we were talking about earlier, if you're more selective with your inventory, people will uh, flock to you because they know that you have that eye, but also that you're very selective. I think that a lot of dealers get caught up in buying bulk and see if I can move bulk. But, uh, you know, there's like 122,000 MS 63, uh, 1881 S Morgans that have been graded you buying my 1881 S Morgan dollar. That's MS 63 or the dealers next to me for a dollar less. That kind of stuff really can weigh down the dealer, but also the market. So like I would say again, Focus on the better dates, and those are really going to be driving your business and um, ultimately help the, the hobby in, in the most way, in my opinion. And how do you navigate that in terms of, you know, that's a great answer, but nice coins, like people are paying up for them. You also want to make a profit. I don't know if you have an example or two that we haven't spoken about, just like case studies where maybe one, you could give us one that you flip quickly that we haven't talked about, one that you held on to longer and tried to wait out for a higher dollar. And, you know, again, if you know the grades and prices, you know, the going and going out, that would be helpful to think about. Yeah, there's a lot of great things that have been happening with, with certain coins. But what I would say is that, um, you know, uh, what we look at really when we approach a deal is that what is gray sheet on a coin and then what what is the auction records on a coin. And so we can go back to just to that three cent silver that we were talking about. Gray sheet was twelve hundred. Uh, we paid one hundred fifty over that for thir thirteen fifty. The the recent one that sold at auction um, from Heritage, which can be found in PCGS Coinfax, was for twenty four hundred. So you know you have a winner coin or a winner coin when you basically look at gray sheet, but then look at auction records and see that delineation or that really big change in price. And recognizing that the coin there's only seven hundred twenty five made, that can really put you in a new category right like you don't want to buy a coin that has 35 million made because once again that'll put you in a category that's not so favorable so finding those low mintage coins that people are going to be looking for but also have that that really big gap in terms of gray sheet and what's what they're currently selling for you'll end up making more than 10 percent, and sometimes you'll make 30 or 40 percent and so that's kind of a, a bigger example right now off the top of my head but it really does it really does work for this, I think. Along with the last question, Drew, um, you were talking about like getting bigger coins, better coins, um, harder to find coins. Like, so have you had any coins that have like just sat in inventory before, or like have just, have sat like longer than you would have liked? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, a bigger coin, as of recently, that's been sitting for a while, has been uh, this 1909 SVDB that we bought. So, you know, the SVDB is, you know, the most sought after coin, but it really, once you, sometimes when you buy a grade, that's like really high, ours is a 65 red Brown. Um, sometimes you really need a client for it or need, need to be in the group of clients that will pay almost $5,000 for a coin. And so that's one that's been sitting for a while, but it, what's great about those coins is that if you buy them for the right price and then you end up waiting that, you know, five or six months, and then it ends up selling for a pretty substantial premium, it really saves you a lot of the grunt work, right? Yeah. And and the, what I'm meaning by grunt work is that, you know, Isaiah, you find a coin at a show and you buy it for 80 bucks and then you sell it for 100 bucks yeah. and then you have to pay for shipping. Well, great, you made 17%. That's awesome, right? But you have to do that 50 times a day. But sometimes with those bigger coins, you end up waiting, but it ends up saving you so much time because you're putting one coin in a package you're only having to advertise it one way in a certain way. And so that's the one we've been holding on for a while and hoping we can move it soon for sure. Yeah, no, that's helpful. And I think, you know, I also dealing at, at college will often sit on things longer than I feel like I should. And those those turnovers are huge. But then like the larger ones, um, you know, can really make a difference. I think one thing I'm thinking about, I know the last time we spoke, you had made a few YouTube videos, hadn't really um, 
followed up too much and then all of a sudden you know started making content and and i think i still enjoy really listening to a lot of it um and and maybe you could tell us if it's transformed your business to have that um it maybe it's sort of just continued you see a few more sales here and there sort of thinking a little bit taking a step back again with your business model what it's meant um and whether you'd recommend other people make coin content well i think the biggest uh reason why people should make content and it's really transformed our business is because basically, I mean, it's, it's not to sound uh, uh, strange or anything, but basically you're shifting public opinion to do certain things that you might want to do. Right. So say we want to start merch sales or say we want to sell coins or say we want to talk about coins and then people get interested. But at the end of the day, those people end up being people that want to support you and do the things that you like to do. And so, uh, what's been great about the channel is that we've been doing a lot of submissions and instead of going to shows, you know, you'd go to a show, spend three or four days getting there. Now we just say, now we just have people that call us and say, Hey, we have $3,000 worth of coins at gray sheet. We have $5,000 worth of coins at gray sheet. Um, but also, which is a plus is that people ask us to send stuff to CAC and also uh, ask us to send stuff to PCGS. And what's great about that, which would revolutionize everyone's business, is that once those coins come home from BCGS or CAC and they don't want those coins, you're literally the first person in line. You don't have to drive anywhere. You don't have to look online. You don't have to wait for people to ship it to you. You have no upfront costs and everything um, is available to you. And so what's been really great about YouTube is that we've had a lot of people that have wanted to support us, but also people that uh, feel like they're a community and can trust us. I mean, we've, we've probably received about $10,000, $12,000 in coins this week that aren't even ours, but we're handling for, for certain people. And so that's what, what's been really good about YouTube. And I'm hoping we can do much better um, as the year progresses. For sure. It sounds like a lot of good, you know, action as a result. And it sounds like, you know, you're working hard, submitting a lot of things, sending it to CAC, PCGS, grading companies. I'm going to ask about that in a moment. Um, what's your like work-life balance? How much are you uh, spending time-wise on coins and, and sort of what are you focused? Say it's 10 hours a week, you know, what percentage is focused on dealing, going to, you know, I'd imagine it's 10 hours a week, but you know, Maybe it's 50% dealing, 20% content creation, 30% going to shows. You know, how do you think it breaks down for you? So I would say we spend about five to 10% um, a week um, on shows and, uh, you know, on show, not, not on shows, but on like creating videos. So it all starts with like a, a central premise of what's been going on in a week. Like someone tells me a certain thing and then I want to address it or we go to a certain show and I want to film it. A lot of the from filming to um, the end of the editing process would take about, you know, about two to three hours a week to do all three videos um, from for most of the coin dealing stuff and working on all the logistical stuff. I mean, it's probably, you know, it's probably a 50 50 on those. Um, we we don't really I don't really do too much. I mean, it's really just all about it, your headspace. Are you going to the gym? Um, what, what's next to be uploaded? What's next to be on the website? Um, am I answering all the messages? Um, so my work-life balance is complete crap, but I mean, that's just the way it goes for now. And, you know, in normal business is about five to seven years. You can hire somebody, you can make things scalable, but for right now, if you're not committed, you won't survive. And so, um, you have to be committed and that's kind of what we're been doing recently. But hopefully we can get a work-life balance in a few years. That'd be great. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's a lot of uh, sort of fruits of working hard. And if it's something you enjoy doing, I always think those are the things to really pour into. And, you know, that can definitely give you a little more longevity in doing that. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned, I was going to ask anyways, we get pulled in a lot of directions. You know, what do you think? How's the business going to change over the next five years? Um, obviously, maybe a little bit of a call on how the coin industry is going to change, but also um, if you're going to shift or if you're just going to try to do what you do incrementally better every day. So I think the best way, honestly, right now to to do to change in the next five years for most of us would be moving more into online. How can we make more content? How can we get more eyes uh, watching what we do? How can we get more people involved in the space? How can we get them more excited about the space? 
all of that really can be done online and it can be done for a fraction of the cost of a storefront. So the last time we talked, it was about, you know, you know, it was a while ago, but we wanted to, you know, we were thinking about a storefront, but at the end of the day, if we really focus on content, we focus on um, creating, you know, more interesting content, but also well-developed content that really can get more people excited. And if we can spread that to more people, um, at the end of the day, that's going to be end up, end up winning. You're just going to reach more people instead of having a storefront. So what I would say in the next five years is develop our content better, um, be able to reach more people with our content, you know, going on TikTok, going on Instagram, going on Facebook, everything broadcasted on all cylinders and continue to develop connections. Um, you know, we probably have a 20, 25 consistent client base. I mean, if we can get that to 100, 200 and then you know a lot of that would be great and so um, that's the main points that I would have in the next five years it, it seems pretty simple but it does take a lot of thought as you know christian and isaiah how do you think why do you send coins to cac that was something i, I said i wanted to follow up on you know what's the advantage there how important are you seeing cac you know as something where people are maybe only wanting to buy cac coins maybe people care less maybe premiums are slightly up you know relative to before covid how, how do you think about cac so the way i see cac in a lot of ways is that um there's certain there's certain collectors that really like cac and what they do and just the prestigiousness of what you know what encapsulates the sticker and so when you're sending stuff to cac and it, for us, like you were talking about earlier, it gets us into a, a, a different ballpark with people that want to send stuff to CAC and want to trust us with their coins. But also it gets us into, uh, you know, a little bit of a different client level that will say we're not going to buy any coin. We're going to buy the coin that has the CAC sticker. And, uh, yeah, like like I said, though, it's just opening you up to more groups of people that are in the space that want to buy coins from you. And I think CAC is like any other any other thing that you might have. You know, say you buy Morgan dollars, 100 of them, or you have 50 of them. And then one day you say, man, I love that Mercury dime. And then you start selling Mercury dimes. It's the same way with CAC. Yeah, you know, you're going to buy some certain coins, but I think CAC can be like its own category sometimes for people. If the CAC sticker's not on there, they won't buy it. And so that's a great question. But I think CAC is going to be... Uh, it's going to be a powerhouse for sure in the next 25 years in numismatics. So, Drew, like going back to um, what we were talking, you saying that you had a lack of a work-life balance, um, would you kind of like walk through what an average day looks like um, in the Haddock household? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I used to wake up at like noon or 1130, and that was a big mistake because a lot of stuff – ends up being pushed to the back burner and you don't finish until like five or six o'clock. But now I've been waking up at eight. So that's been a little bit better. But basically when we start the day, I'm either uh, creating a video, editing a video. And, uh, you know, I wake up at eight o'clock and have that done about 10 o'clock, maybe 1030. Uh, I, and then after that, I pick up my binder. I start printing out all the labels that we have. And then I go downstairs and I start packaging up all the coins that we have. Um, then we take all those coins to the post office. We get all the packages that we might get in. And then we have to basically, you know, it's uh, you're pricing every coin out. You're pricing how much you paid for it. And then we have to structure those coins in a certain video that would make more sense. So say if we're talking about Indian head sense or talking about high end coins or modern coins, all of that has to be geared to specific days. They're uploaded on YouTube and the channel. And then we're also, so every other day is basically an upload day during the week. So we have to spend the nights filming, um, going through ideas, responding to all the DMs, responding to all the comments on YouTube. Um, and then I have to actually go look for inventory again when we have ex excess money. And we also, you know, so it's, uh, it's very interesting how everything kind of works. Every day can be different. And uh, we also have like the stuff that we're trying to do with branding, you know, create stickers, create shirts. Um, and you also have to push everything else forward. So how is the website going to change and how what we're buying is going to change. So it's just it's a list of endless questions, but a lot of it doesn't end until, you know, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And then when you wake up the next day, you have I mean, it's something that, you you know, you don't want to take for granted, but you have like 15 messages on Instagram. You have 
20 new comments on your YouTube channel. And then all of that, when can you do that during the day? So it's a, it's a very interesting topic, but it's something that you really have to focus on if you want to cultivate a community. Yeah, I really like that. Cultivating a community. That's what like, this sounds like a, really what your business kind of revolves around. Exactly. Sweet. Well, well maybe uh, we'll start wrapping up. Um, it's been great to, to chat with you, Drew, and glad Isaiah can join us. Um, and maybe if you have one piece of advice that you haven't given in a long time uh, to the coin collector, um, you know, who might be watching this and, and then we'll touch ba base maybe in a month or two months or something like that. But yeah, what's one a rare piece of advice? So uh, an advice I would have for somebody that's in this space is that the only way that you're going to really be able to stick out and be, be unequivocally you is that you have to be starving every single day of your life. Um, if you're if you're not starving, you'll end up being somebody else that falls behind or saying that the business won't work. If you're starving every day, you'll be willing to take risks. You'll be willing to think of new ideas. You'll be willing to be different from somebody else, even if it takes more time and more effort. So what I would say to somebody that wants it, I would say that you have to be starving every single day. You have to be willing to be better than everybody else. You have to be willing to leave your chair or leave whatever you're doing. Uh, after everybody else has already gone to sleep or ate dinner. So um, that's what I haven't really talked about in a while. But I think that if you're not starving, you're not going to be able to be different and set yourself apart from the rest of the coin dealers in the space. All right. Thank you very much. And, and uh, you know, keep working hard. And I, I look forward, you know, it's great to have people on share their thoughts, opinions and, and information and knowledge that people can gain from. And I'll see you in a few months. Hey, thank you, Christian, and thank you, Isaiah, for having me on. And uh, look forward to doing this again. You guys uh, run a great channel, and uh, I'm going to be watching some videos tonight for sure. If you guys made it until the end, you are a champ, and I thank you. If you made it to the end, please write Cheetos down in the description below. I'm sorry, down in the comment section below, and it'll mean a lot. And uh, we're at Grapevine uh, when you're watching this, so uh, we hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. Make sure to subscribe if you're new, and we will see you guys in the next one.